Welcome to your Artsy Girl podcast. I am your host, Christina Carrere. This is a podcast about art, poetry, writing, and anything about creativity. Sit back, relax, and get your dose of brain food to get your creative juices flowing. Welcome to episode 54. Today's featured guest is Jason Tannemore. He has 10 plus years of experience as an entertainment writer and interviewer for Yahoo, the Moline Dispatch Rock Island Argus, Cinema Blend, Celebrity Cafe, Strip Las Vegas Magazine, Pulse Magazine, and Soik's Online. Tannemore has interviewed the likes of author Chuck Palahniuk, Fight Club, comedians Dimitri Martin, Jim Brower, SNL and Half-Baked, Aisha Tyler from Talk Soup and the Ghost Whisperer, Dane Cook and Gabriel Iglesias, musicians Billy Corgan from Smashing Pumpkins, Anne Wilson from Heart, Taylor Momsen, The Pretty Reckless and Gossip Girl, Chad Smith from Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Henry Rollins, Black Flag, and baseball legend Pete Rose. He has covered everyone from Steve Martin to Jerry Seinfeld and from Evanescence to President Obama. With novels, Tannemore enjoys writing in different genres. He is the critically acclaimed author of the dark novels Anonymous, which received a star review from Publishers Weekly, and Drama Dolls, the satirical novels Hello Fabulous and She's the One, and the epic superhero-themed children's book I Heart Superhero Kid. His newest novel, Vampires of Portlandia, is an urban fantasy. Tannemore is married and has a family of fur children. He currently lives and works in the Portland, Oregon area. Everyone, please welcome my next featured guest, Jason Tannemore. Hi, Jason. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for coming on the show. I just want to say welcome. And uh, before we get into your writing and stuff, um, we'd like to you know, learn, learn more about you. Can you tell us like where you're from and where you grew up? Sure. Uh, I'm uh, from Iowa and Illinois border, um, commonly known as the Quad Cities. My parents are from the Philippines. They immigrated to the Quad Cities through Seattle uh, back in the 70s. Uh, it was actually December. It was actually Christmas Eve in 1974. And the only reason I know that because I was born in April 75. Oh. And I basically spent most of my life up into 2018 when my wife and I moved to Portland, Oregon for uh, jobs. So we kind of grew up in the Quad City area. I lived, I grew up in the de- the Iowa side, but then when I got married, moved to the Illinois side, but they're all still within the same vicinity. And we worked for the Rock Island Arsenal uh, Department of Defense and never thought we'd ever leave. And then uh, some promotions came up and found ourselves in Portland, Oregon in 2018. Wow. That's the area of the United States I'm not familiar with. So it's interesting to see, you know, Filipino communities there. Um, I'm sure you can find Filipinos at every corner of the oh, world. Sure. Sure. There's actually there's actually a large Filipino uh, population. We I, I remember growing up. Uh, My parents are still a part of the Filipino American Association, and I remember growing up being forced to dance Filipino dances in uh, um, (laughs) years ago. Yeah, well, to nickling, uh, planting rice, Uh coconut dance, and I remember years ago um, when I'm in you know mid 40s now, but when I was probably eight, nine, or ten. Uh, my old, there's, I'm the middle of three boys, but my older brother and I really did it because back then <laughs> it was very prevalent. We had these folk festivals mm-hmm. and we would have to dance every year. And it was weird because the Filipino, uh, it was really the Filipino Association back then. There was a random Filipina or Filipino who was married to a either you know white person or right. African American <laughs> or whatever. And it was just now. I still go periodically when I'm in the area. Uh, I still belong membership wise, but trying to get to some of the events now. But since I've gone, though, it's almost like there's more interracial, you know, mixed marriages now. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I I think I don't know if they I think they still do the dances, but I don't know if like the younger generation that are mixed do it 
more than some of the older generation that I grew up with. They're still doing ones for right. like some of the. I think yeah, they like are in the- certain places. Like here in Tampa, we have our annual Filipino festival, okay. and you know they do the whole. Oh, you got to have the the uh, area beauty um, contest. You know, yeah. but but they do it like it's not all that. It's about just you know they they start from like little little girls to older old even like seniors senior women so it's like really just about you know community and everything so yeah. that that's always neat i, I just like that cuz you know i grew up in the philippines and um having uh stayed here in in the states like after 18 on up i, I feel you know more disconnected where i'm at there's hardly any filipinos yeah oh, and then when yeah. i went to when i went to san francisco i was like oh my goodness there's a lot a lot <laughs> yes there's a it's funny because we when we moved here in late uh, 18, you know, for the first year we really spent, and my wife is white, so we, we really spent just trying to get to know the area, um, kind of get, uh, make up the finances from the move and trying to learn new, you know, start new jobs and all that. So I never really, uh, looked into it, but now I, I've reached out to the Filipino association in uh, the Portland area and there's mm-hmm. just a lot of them and people will oh, like sure. will find me from like Seattle, which is a couple hours away and and invite me to things. And it's just, it's just I don't know if it's the West Coast. It's just really weird. So. Oh, yeah. You know, if there's like if you go to an area and there's a Filipino family there, they invite you over have <laughs> yeah. concert. for sure. Yeah. That's have what happened in Connecticut. Right. <laughs> It's like they had a, they were having a festival, a fiesta or something. Oh, come on over. I was That's like, okay. <laughs> I That's didn't even funny. know these people. <laughs> no, I know. They, what they treat you, they'll do anything for you, too. And that's what's, that's what's nice about it. Because uh, we always joke, you know, the first time if a Filipino first meets you, the first thing they'll ask you is if you've eaten yet. And it's true. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. So you are a uh, writer. Can you tell us a little more about you and your, your you know, your work? Uh, what kind of writing do you do? Yeah. So when I, uh, you know, my parent, my mom's part Chinese, part Filipino, my dad's uh, Filipino. And um, as you probably know that, you know, they want you to be something practical. Uh, So Mm -hmm. growing up, I never knew that I never, you know, I knew I read books, but I never really understood that this is what their job was. I just thought someone wrote a book. I never knew you could do it. (laughs) So I went to college, uh, graduated with a degree in accounting and it wasn't, and this was back in 98 when I graduated. And then a little after that, I started just journaling a lot and I started just reading more humor type columns and, and short story type stuff like that. And, and one of my biggest things that I loved doing and watching was stand up comedy back in the day. So right. I started trying, oh, I'm just going to go up and start doing stand up. And so I did that for a little bit and it was fun. And and during the course of me doing it and where I grew up in Iowa, Illinois, Chicago was a couple hours away. So we didn't have a huge market. There's really like one club that brought in kind of mid names. And if you're a big name, you went to the theater and that you came to the local theater. So mm-hmm. I started just doing stand up where I could. And then I met the one of the editors for the local newspaper at the time. And we just became friends. And one day he emailed me and said, do you want to write for the paper? Just do some stories. And I said, sure, as long as it's not like obituaries or something that I would <laughs> find enjoy, enjoyment in. And he said, well, I actually have a, a spot to do the local like arts. And I were trying to do like some stand up uh, stuff and some music type stuff. So that's where I started. I started actually writing, being a beat comedy writer and random music uh, reviewer and interviewer for my area. And I did that for about five years and I dabbled with writing novels, but I'd never really finished. And I didn't, you know, I didn't think I just, I, it takes a lot of discipline to do it. So, but I, I felt like I really wanted to do that. Mm-hmm. And so I was doing that and then writing just entertainment pieces. And then I met my wife and got married and then I was right working full time trying to do entertainment pieces and then kind of writing novels and got to the point where I really just wanted to write novels. I don't know why if something attracted me to it, but it was just something that I really wanted to do. 
And my wife was like, you know, you're, I, I feel like you're just being stretched thin. You really need to decide what you want to do. So I kind of phased out the entertainment industry, which I really loved doing. I loved, inter- you know, what you do is just interviewing, talking to interesting people. Sure. Um, but it was really just the novel writing that I really wanted to do. And so that's kind of how I fell into it. So I took a couple like workshops and classes uh, online and and um, this is where I'm at. But I wrote a couple novels that were more I, I write in a lot of different genres because I I, 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 I no writers now that are just psychological thriller writers or just fantasy writers and and I just like different types of stories no matter what and mm-hmm. so I just write in different things never really thinking I could do it for a living because now that I've been doing it long enough even successful authors even authors that are best sellers I I'm finding out that they work they have full-time jobs. Oh, of course. Also, yeah, it's yeah. weird because, you know, so, it's, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm so that's kind of, I'm just kind of content with that, but I still love doing it. And so I wrote just in different types of uh, genres that I found interesting. But what I found was that most of the characters were always Caucasian. And because yeah. growing up in the States, essentially as an American Filipino, uh, most of my culture and most of my friends, most of everything I've ever uh, was exposed to was white culture. And it's weird because even now I'm 45 when I'm around a lot of Filipinos, I feel very white. But when I'm with around a lot of white people, I feel very Filipino, which is weird. So it's always just how you perceive things. And so mm-hmm. the new book, Vampires of Portlandia, is really the first book where it features a Filipino family. And it wasn't necessarily because I wanted that to be that. It was because of the story of Oswang. Which yes. Is, um, <laughs> yeah, which is funny because in when I grew up in Illinois, I'd never even heard of this term. And my wife and I used to watch the show Grimm, which coincidentally takes place in Portland. <laughs> and uh, Sergeant Wu, uh, one of the main characters, is Filipino. And there's a an episode where he sees an Oswang. And I was like, what is that? an Oswang? I've never even heard of this term before. So I called my dad and 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 very casually is like, yeah, it's just it's just a story that your grandparents tell you to scare you. I don't believe you, you never. OK, so you never heard the stories of the Oswangs? No, no. Oh, my gosh. I thought every Filipino. Did. <laughs> it's like. No, I I'd never heard it. Like I said, I just grew up as a white kid. Oh, <laughs> like, imagine oh, growing up kid. in the Philippines and growing up with that. It, it oh, seems like real. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, I bet. I bet. And so so when we moved to Portland, I don't know if you've ever been to the Portland area, but um, in downtown uh, around fall, thousands of crows roost in downtown. Wow. It's it's I mean, like, I think there's a if you just if you ever get a chance to Google it. But like, I think there's a guy who runs this uh, um, kind of business that bird something business but he decided to track them one time and he's been tracking them for years and i think like this year alone was like 18 to twenty thousand of crows and it's just like a movie it's you walk downtown because i work right downtown and when it's fall or winter um you know i'm walking in about 6 a.m it's dark and just right. hundreds and hundreds of crows are just like in trees as you're walking and it's and then they caught they caulk and they and it's just creepy. So it kind of sets itself up to this weird uh, environment. And I never had any intention of writing a new book at the while we we're moving because I was just, you know, we're moving to a new across the country and all this stuff. But every day for months, I would just like watch these crows and I you know, your brain starts playing these weird tricks. And that's kind of how the story developed was that these were actual Oswangs that were just living here as crow where where beasts as crows and people and so that's kind of how the story developed yeah i was i started to read um you know part of your novel there and, and i have to say i like your prose a lot um oh thank you. yes 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 um it's it's very literary and um that's one thing you know i have for me my my taste is you know it's got you gotta have you gotta have good prose <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I read. It's funny because I, I feel like there's two types of authors. There's ones that have English degrees and kind of grow up in that 
uh, kind of that environment. And then there's ones like me who have like a background in journalism or some other type of writing Mm -hmm. and then they fall into it. And I will read books that everyone swears like this is this is Pulitzer worthy. You know, these wins all these awards and all this stuff. And I read it and I'm like, I don't like it. I don't know why people exactly like it. you know and it it's yeah it's weird how some people can can totally uh, catapult a, a work and you look at it and you're like I don't see it but okay yeah, I don't get it <laughs> <laughs> but you don't want to be that one that says it it's so subjective <laughs> everything right. that artists and writers do is so subjective you right. know um, so yeah now the the vampire story, um, mm-hmm. Vampire of Portlandia, uh, that that's been recently published. Um, it's actually available for pre-order. It will come out September 29th of this okay. year. All right. <clears throat> so you will um, provide a link, and I could I could post yes. that up for you, and Absolutely. we'll go ahead and check that out. So. Okay, well, that's interesting. So, yeah, I've I've done beat work also um, uh, for local newspapers. So, yeah, I have my interviewing skills from that. <laughs> <laughs> right. People say, you know, you 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 uh, talking to you is so easy. <laughs> right. Right. Because <laughs> well, I, you know, you tell the, you tell me the story, and I'll ask the questions. You know. <laughs> you know, it's funny because you're right. Because like what I, what I've learned about interviewing is you just kind of throw a question out there and just let the subject talk and then you can edit it down however you want and i just became used to this method and then i had the opportunity to interview billy corgan from smashing pumpkins and he gave like the shortest answers i mean i would like ask a question and then dr- take a drink of those, water and he was those just, are yeah, the he was hardest yes. oh my He'd gosh no. <laughs> and i'm like oh okay it's like you have to provide them with something to Go on. You can't do like yes or no answers. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I <Right>. hear you. <laughs> so it's just it's funny how uh, how you learn kind of as you go, and and you have to learn to adjust. And I think that like people who do interview people, they really have to be uh, learn. No, they have, kind of have to know a lot about what they're doing and what the subject is for you to kind of maneuver this conversation into something that's not. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer. Like you said, it's got to flow into a conversation. Well, yeah. So this, the reason in my platform, of course, it's talking to writers and artists, um, learning more about them and their work. And I like to start off to, you know, where where you're from and, and where you grew up, because, I'm, I mean, that's how you get to know people. Right. And right. um and and it really it's very interesting because I believe your background really um, dictates your work too. So, oh yeah, sure. Um, now, so how many pieces uh, of writing you've published so far? I mean, as far as novels, you said uh, this would be the seventh. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, okay. I've, so I, I want to start prolific. writing more Filipino bait. Well, I would. I w- I'd like to try to. I like to write. At least I like to try to at least write one novel a year, um, mm. not necessarily have them come out, you know, but I, I like to try to I, I to me, if I don't write, I'll I won't be good at it. And that's just something I struggle with. So I got to keep uh, keep the practice going. And, and interesting. I, so where do you get your topics? That's where I struggle. I mean, I, I'm like, OK, I, w- I want to write, but what? Yeah. You know, I have to be interested in a topic enough to like really delve sure. into it. Where sure. do you get your your ideas? Well, um, for you know, vampires specifically were the crows, and I thought like, okay, what if the crows were people? Mm-hmm. What if they were really Aswan, these shapeshifters? And and then I start my brain starts thinking like, I see these crows everywhere. Maybe they're following me for some reason. Do you know Why how many follow- Filipinos probably thought the same thing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's so weird because the crows here are huge and some of them are so big. And, and I feel like sometimes you see the same ones, but they're probably not. But so that becomes an idea. And the, the key, yeah. though, is, is like, are these ideas? Can you extrapolate these ideas into 300 pages or so? And when I first started, that was my struggle. And I, and I think it was really because I have a, a lot of just stupid ideas that 
oh, this would be cool for a story, but then it does, nothing happens out of it. So I've learned to now start outlining stories, and you really have to have a couple stories within the same story yes. to kind of keep the pacing. But um, my last book, which was called Drama Dolls, it's about a bunch of uh, – Men, it's about a bunch of this uh, this grown man whose wife passes away, and when he grieves her death, he starts dressing up as a cheerleader and robs houses with his friends. And the and the way it came out was, I was just watching this. I was on Facebook, and uh, this someone had posted this documentary about these grown men in Europe who had this fetish of dressing up as dolls. Um, and walking out in public and people would just stare at them and, and in their brain, they thought that people were staring at them because they were beautiful. But the reality of a lot of times was people were staring at them because it was just what, what, the, what am I looking at type thing? Yeah. And so it just kind of became a weird story of, uh, you know, why would the, someone do that? Something triggered that uh, emotion. And so the only thing I could really think of that would be jarring would be, OK, what if he lost a spouse? You know, what would you do to 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 get through this? And so that's how that story came about. But um, I, I have a couple of novels that I have finished and mm-hmm. some of them are there. Some of them are based. One of them is based off uh, the martial law era in yeah. the Philippines with Mar- uh, Fernand Marcos. And then the other one is actually I've, I've been pitching a, about my time growing up dancing Filipino dances. It's about a kid really? who's in high school. Yeah. And he wants to, he, he loves dancing, but he doesn't want anyone to know about it. And then he finds out that the, the, there's no more money um, in this, this arena. And so they're going to close the folk festival and says last year, do it. And then wow. he just happens to meet a girl who is totally in love with him and his culture and all that. And he's really doing his best to try to balance, not telling not exposing a secret with building this relationship. And as you can imagine, two teenagers trying to hide things from each other yeah. kind of <laughs> goes awry. So I've been, and there's, I have two completed novels that I'm just kind of pitching, but I don't know. I mean, stories just, there's a lot of times I think about things and then nothing will happen, but then a year later or something will just develop. And it's, a, it's almost like that aha moment. It's, it's, I can't even describe it. Do you do you work like some painters do or you have one piece of painting that you're working in tandem with another or uh, are you uh, just committed into one piece of work at a time? I, I, I'm usually committed to one piece. I, I generally don't. I'm usually committed to one piece when I'm writing, but I generally mm-hmm. don't start writing that story until it's I've fleshed out an entire story. So I'll, I'll, I'll take a lot of notes. I'll. Uh, the nice thing where I live, I don't, I don't actually live in Portland. So I live, uh, in, uh, the next city. Of, so I have to commute in on a train. So I have a, about 30 to 40 minutes where I just kind of sit there and I can just think of things or just kind of plot things. And so I take a lot of notes, I'll write out the notes and I'll start outlining the story once it comes up. But once it's outlined from beginning to almost the end, I'll start writing it. But during that time, I'll, some other idea will come I'll like, Hey, this is a neat idea. And I'll, I'll always try to think if I can put that idea into the current story. Like, is there sure. a way for me to weave that in there that mm-hmm. and to build another layer or I'll just set it aside and then build that kind of, but I, I've never actually writ, started writing two novels, like the actual writing at mm-hmm. once. I, Cause you know, my day job is uh, I, I'm a contracting officer for the Corps of Engineers. So I'm writing a lot of contracts. I'm reading a lot of times I'm reading, 200 pages of just oh stuff. yeah yeah so, so your brain power yeah, is right is, yeah <laughs> by the time you. i get home it's, it's like i don't want to read anything okay so uh, in that case how do you um keep a balance and and keep writing or do you just have when you have a good uh, it, from my experience it's like mm-hmm. i i kind of forgive myself if i can't be as productive as i want to and say okay i'll have a better day um, next tomorrow or whenever, and then just proceed that way. How do you approach it? I actually wake up. Uh, I'm, I have to write the same time every day. So I wake up between three 30 and 4 AM and I'll, while I'm drinking coffee, I'll just do about an hour or so. And I might get a thousand words in. I might get like 10 words in. I might just kind of write notes out. Um, 
And then I usually... No matter if you... I'm sorry, but no matter no, how no. you feel, you force yourself yes. to write yes. something. Because for me, the, I hate writing the first draft. I, I'm more of a... Once the story's there, I can, I can tailor it to... I can edit it the way I want. Um, I, 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 I love coming up with the story. I love coming up with the plot twist. But I hate putting it down initially on paper. Mm-hmm. And then if I could get a ghostwriter to do that for me. I love the second, the third, the 12th draft. But yeah, when there's times I want to do it, I might just get like five words out. I might get like five paragraphs out. I mean, there's times where I've written, I've, I've deleted 8,000 words at one time because days later or weeks later, I'll go, ah, this is awful. But I right. think for me, it's more of a muscle memory as I have to do it because if I, if I go long if there's a drought where I don't do it, I just won't do it anymore. How do you know if the first draft? How do you know if the first draft is complete? I mean, you just when, when you're just um, just it's more of a stream of consciousness kind of thing, right? A process. Well, I I I don't really like this. I don't. I'm not really a big stream of consciousness because I I, I feel like um, depends on. I guess it depends on the book. So I, I'm more of a, a story generated story move moving you know not i i have one literary book that i wrote called anonymous where it's more it's really there's no plot it's really just a bunch of prisoners talking to each other mm-hmm. um but there's growth in the characters but uh when i'm outlining each chapter has something to to yeah like so you you, yeah, you map out. it out you map everything yes. out and you yeah. kind of fill it in and then you you massage it you know yeah and, through yeah. the so many I, edits after. I, mm-hmm. I usually try to get a strong outline up to three-fourths of the way in, and then the ending, I kind of have different endings. Uh, and depending on where that goes will dictate that ending. But it's for me, it's always been nice to have an ending because it's always been easier for me to write to an ending versus right. just writing. And I think that was my problem when I first started was, I don't know how people write these novels when after about, you know, 30 pages, I just get bored. I don't know if I'm getting bored. I just don't know where it's going. Uh, so. Yeah. So you want something kind of <laughs> not too slow, not too, not too fast either. I mean, I, I yeah. find that if it's a fast read, it's not, I'm not immersed enough in it. You know, I have sure, to right, like right. really, you know, contemplate and kind of feel for the characters and things like that. But yeah. well, Wow, I love to you know listen to other writers uh, discuss their process, you know, and I, I and I hope that this is uh, interesting to other folks who are who are writers well, or who are interested in it. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people in different stages, and like like you said, with when it flows too easily, sometimes your you know your brain is designed to sometimes skip over words. So there is actually a technique uh, that uh, there's a local writer in Portland area um, named Tom Spanbauer and one of the techniques was called burnt tongues where you kind of put words together or use unusual words. And I'm probably messing this up, but (laughs) basically it's like um, you might use words in different order that mean the same thing, which forces the reader to slow down. Uh So a lot of times when some of that prose comes really easy for now, you have an important scene or something that you need the reader to pay attention to. You might slow it down in a fashion that, uh, that will get them to Kind of, kind of like read it more clearly, and that was that's just a technique. And and I know a lot of people who it astonishes me that like yeah they might read a lot of books, but there's still process, there's still technique, there's still point of views, there's still mm-hmm. you know best ways to write it. And and I I don't know how many people I, I know will just start writing, and everything's in first person present. It's always about you know the narrator being. I, 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 I can't yeah. I can't stand I'm ugh. you know my favorite is um third person uh omniscient <laughs> yeah that's what vampires is and yes that's why yeah. I was like wow that's good I like that well I I think that's the most important thing when you're when you finally start writing is what point of view it's going to be written in because you can write any story in any point of view probably but I think there's really one of the most effective in the book I wrote um about martial law is uh I started writing it in first person because uh, I thought it would be easier to get it down. And once I got it down on on paper, 
I started writing it in third person omniscient. And then when I sent it to someone to look at, she's like, I really think this should be third person limited. So I, I rewrote it. I mean, I, I essentially rewrote this book at least four or five times um, and trying to, and a lot of it was just very mechanical, just trying to change I to, you know, the person. Wow. Name, no, I've tried that. Yeah. I've tried changing perspective um, from, for, Oh, that's hard. It is. It is. But <laughs> it, it is made like, it so you, much better. You're afraid that you're going to miss like, you yes. know, Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. That is hard. And I, I, I just said, never mind. I'll just stay, <laughs> stick with my third person. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I that's love doing cool. it. It's either that or it's either that or play video games. You know, I, I know people <laughs> who waste so much time playing video games. They probably think the same about me, but I just sit here. I like, I don't want to just be that person who comes home from work and just plays video games all day and uh, whatever. <laughs> be, well, you have a very cerebral, cerebral job and you're pretty much spent when you come home. So do you just like veg out? Out and then wake up in the morning and then do your thing. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. It's very. I, I'm spent when I come home too. I'm like, uh, uh-uh, I can't. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm an early, I'm an early bird. Back. Yeah, I'm yeah. an early bird. So, well, that's cool. Well, do you have a, a short piece um, to share with us? Yeah, I, I can write read the first uh, few paragraphs of Vampires of Portland. It kind of sets up the scene and introduces the main character. Yes, please. All right. So, all right. So, chapter one. The crows arrived each season to roost, usually around late fall, when the weather dropped and the daylight reduced into long evenings. They congregated in murders, packs of hundreds, if not thousands, to join in for a giant slumber party. It was as if there was an unwritten agreement between downtown Portland and the crows to arrive in the cast shadows and to sing their lullaby to locals who were brave enough to show themselves. For the first several years the family resided in the Rose City, Percival paid no attention to the crows. With the seasons turning, however, it was difficult to not notice. They were everywhere. The holiday season was upon Portland. Merriment was in the air, and the rush of Christmas was around the corner. It was approaching December, which meant the days were short, while the nights tended to run forever. Pioneer Square had erected the 75-foot Douglas fir. People from all over the city ventured to the square to catch a glimpse of the tree. It was a tradition for residents and tours alike, staring at the enormous tree as they stuffed their faces with sweets and such while purchasing gifts for their loved ones. Percival pedaled his rickshaw with great force, thrusting his heels into the pedals as he scaled the slight yet never-ending slope of a street away from the river. As he reached level ground, a young child ran out in front of him. He jerked the handlebars to the left, riding down a flight of stairs, each step causing a slight vibration in his wrist. He bunny-hopped a curb and then ricocheted off the side of a building to clear a right angle just to avoid a homeless tent. Percival, discomforted by the sight of a homeless woman screaming at passersby, one who, he'd noticed, had misplaced her shoes and was standing in bare feet, pedaled a bit faster. With the influx of people, the vampire had learned to navigate the streets of downtown with ease. His bike had become an extra appendage, strong and sturdy, something he could control gracefully no matter the circumstances. Percival's physically fit body also helped. His muscles were toned, and his hair often fell to his shoulders or blew through the wind as his speed increased. He didn't exercise traditionally, the only workout coming from the continual bicycling. But try pedaling through a brutal wind that had appeared out of thin air, dodging people nonetheless. It was the most challenging workout you could stomach. He was only in his early 20s and working full-time while his brother Roger and the twins Gina and Marco attended high school and grade school respectively. Although Percival knew that his siblings could care for themselves, they were vampires just like him after all, and had extraordinary powers, he took his role of man of the house seriously. It was something his Lola taught him at an early age, responsibility. As the saying went, with great power came great responsibility. The vampire didn't have the power just yet. Rather, he was next in line to inherit the amulet that would enable him to reign over the Oswang vampires. End. Awesome. Yes. Oh, wow. That is cool. I mean, Filipino style. <laughs> <laughs> A vampire story, Filipino style. Absolutely. Right. It's, it, it's funny because, like, you know, rickshaws were, uh, tricycles were big in the Philippines. To, yes. <laughs> and, and here in downtown, there are so many couriers that pedal these rickshaws with these huge cabs on the back. And I'm like, God, some of these kids look like they're skin and bones and they're riding up and down the city. <laughs> with they these have rickshaws in, in Portland? Yeah, that's how they deliver food. 
found oh, no it. way. Yeah. So that was kind of how the, you know, a lot of it uh, manifest was I'm just walking around downtown. There's a bunch of crows. Oh, hey, there's a kid delivering uh, food on a mm. bike. That's weird. Yeah. So it's coming out in September. Yes, it's through the Parliament House Press, um, and it comes out September 29th, and it's available for pre-order uh, online now. Um, you can get it through my website at tanamore.com, and there are multiple formats or places you can get it. Uh, some people like prefer Amazon. If you live in Portland, they hate Amazon, so yes. there's uh-huh. things to do. But uh, print, uh, it's fourteen ninety nine, and right now digitally it's 99 cents with uh the whole COVID 19 just kind of right. ties people to you know to i know some people are hurting financially so yeah that's awesome well <laughs> definitely everybody should go out and get it yeah. seriously um so speaking of COVID 19 um do you see how any effects in in your creativity you know it's funny because both my wife, she works for the Forest Service. Um, so we're both federal employees and we're very grateful. We still have jobs and we're able to work from home. And I always thought that I would have more time, but I, I don't, I, I, I kind of feel I'm more of an extrovert. And so I think like, I feel like I've had cabin fever and <laughs> um, so I, you know, I, I, I've kind of just been in a funk. So we've been watching a lot of TV, uh, but I haven't gotten as much writing as I wanted to. Um, I started thinking about a, the next project, but it's kind of just there. Not yeah. Nothing really happened. But I, yeah. I can feel like I'm starting to get motivated again, but I'm just watching a lot of I'm feeling some reading. way, too. Yeah, it yeah. took me a while. I felt uh, still kind of discombobulated, you know, just like, oh, this is a different reality you know because you're used to well i was used to having that same routine going to work you know that separation yeah. of work and family life and now you're working from home with family and <laughs> yeah that's yeah. the only person people and it's like to. groundhog day every day <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> Well, thank you for sharing your work and um, getting to know you. And uh, definitely, I mean, it's amazing. Uh, You know, when I put the call out, I try to find, you know, Filipino writers and artists. Mm -hmm. And I'm so glad you, um, you know, you reached out. Uh, And what is Down the Pike for you? Um, Well, I have the two novels that I've uh, finished that I'm pitching right now. um, But. Other than that, I'm just concentrating on uh, promoting the new book. I'm hoping that I, I'm seeing a lot of authors who have books out now that a lot of things are getting canceled, obviously. Yeah. So, you know, I, I'm hoping that that this doesn't impact it too much. But I completely understand if someone needs to buy food versus buying a book. Yeah, I'm not going to that. So it's just bad timing, but things happen. I've always thought things happen for reasons. And hopefully something good can come out of this. But that's all I've been doing is I've been doing a lot of interviews and and, and trying to just promote uh, the book um, for a release in September. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And it was great talking to you. And um, please stay in touch. Okay. I will do that. Well, everyone, that is it for now. Please tune in next week for my next featured guest. In the meantime, have a productive and creative week. Bye, Jason. Bye. Thank you.